all right let's begin the session uh, welcome today we are going to discuss about information processing model um, just before getting into what information processing model uh, i will just take you through uh, briefly into uh, what we have seen in last two sessions uh, the first session we were looking at the evolution of education and uh, how instruction design as a, a branch has evolved over time and we have also looked into various learning theories and various learning principles we also looked into different domains of learning and also what it means to be uh, you know delivering an effective program and what makes learning effective so this was the crux of our previous two session um, right now what we will be doing is i will just flip through some of the uh, slides quickly so that we can have a fair understanding of how we have reached uh, made progress so far uh, at first we started off uh, with the evolution of education traditionally it was gurukul gurukul system where uh, the relationship was more of master and disciple relationship and it was primarily focusing on all the aspects of the um, you know life it is uh, the education is not restricted to mathematics or learning a language or learning some religious things it's it's holistic in nature uh, it was covering the uh, um, warfare it was covering arts it was covering um, poetry music everywhere everything it is not limited to any particular uh, uh domain it was so uh, comprehensive and uh, uh, included all aspects of life then we had this colonial system where britishers entered uh, into our uh, uh, into india and then they they had certain objectives they wanted us to learn uh, how to read how to write and perform uh, clerical uh, uh, no jobs so for that reason we had a you kind know, of colonial system of education where the focus was on three r reading writing and arithmetic it was the first formal uh, sort of education system that we had and uh, the teachers were assessed based on their uh, conduct how they con- conduct themselves uh, with um, with the students with the peers how they are respected in the society so things like that matter then post uh, no liberty uh, post freedom uh, this colonial system came to an end and we had our first pedagogical principles based curriculum uh, where subject matter expertise gained a lot of popularity and the weightage uh, was given more on what is being taught than who is teaching and how it how is uh, how he is teaching uh, interpersonal skills also mattered a lot uh, the primary focus was on teacher so it was about you as a teacher uh, what can you offer and how you are conducting yourself in terms of interpersonal relationship and things like that then in, then we moved further uh, which is into this 21st century where all this uh, technological advancement has come where we live in a multicultural society uh, where in each and every individual is looking to construct meaning and the learning is not a passive uh activity rather it is an active process where student and teacher interact involve engage and share their views discuss debate and learn so the focus has changed from teacher centric to learner centric that's a kind of transformation that has happened um in last uh, 200 to 300 years see from gurukul system to google mm-hmm. that's how we have progressed um i hope you guys are following if there is any question you can just pass and let me check if everybody is following it just give me a moment can you guys hear me uh, so far it's clear i just need a confirmation type yes yeah yeah you you can also type yes in the chat section that will be better because not uh, some people might be using on phone and uh, probably i just wanted to ensure that everybody is like equally um, following mm-hmm. 
Great. So Dilipan is responding on chat. Um, all right. Um, so let's move forward. With, uh, so this is how the education uh, uh, education system has evolved. Now we will be looking at how instruction design as a uh, brand or as a science has evolved. Uh, we also discussed on session one how uh, World War II being the biggest reason for uh, instruction design to come into existence. Where the primary focus was to give the war men uh, some, some sort of instruction and they will have to go and execute it so that um, so that's, that's how uh, the need for instruction evolved. Um, it was supported by many experts uh, like uh, B.F. Skinner, uh, Benjamin Bloom, uh, uh, Robert uh, Gagne, and Robert Glasser. So many people have contributed uh, for the development or complete transformation of how instruction design has evolved and what it is today. Uh, it has reached because of so many people contributing to this one particular stream. Um, so that we have discussed in detail at the last uh, session. Uh, moving forward, we also saw how various learning theories have evolved and who contributed for what, uh, starting from uh, Ivan Pablo kind of performing classical conditioning as early as 1890s and then uh, establishing founder um, you know, uh, uh, behaviorism as a mainstream of uh, you know academic uh, by John B. Watson, then later uh, promoted by uh, uh, Ludwig von Bethlenfri. Um, he came up with this general management system. He started developing it in 1940s, but it got its final shape in 1968. Then by P. F. Skinner, who came up with this classical, you know, operant conditioning theory, um, where uh, uh, plenty of dimensions about behaviorism. Uh, were revealed and uh, how the individual learn uh, was discussed at a you know at a very high higher level of science and the psychological aspect of behaviorism took uh, a great shape. Then we also had Benjamin but Benjamin Bloom who came and uh, um, came gave us the three domains of learning. Um, Benjamin Bloom contributed uh, in, in in a way that. Um, Learning can also be made a systematic, uh, you know, medium, and you can. Uh, um, if there are three domains: affective, cognitive, and psychomotor. And he was the one who defined how training can be given in a systematic way. So he was the one who formalized the uh, systematic approach towards training. Then later, uh, uh, Robert. Major uh, gave this learning objectives. So you need to have certain learning objectives and arriving at the learning objective, writing learning as objective and writing assessments are critical part, which was given by Robert Major. And then Glasser also said that it is also important to notice what is their entry level behavior and what is their post uh, training behavior. And then what if there is any change, that's the effectiveness, the impact. And uh, Robert Gagne has been uh, can be considered as the greatest, you know. One second. Um, hi, hi, I mean, I can see. Yes, can you hear me? Okay, great. So I am just uh, giving a brief about um, what we have seen so far. Uh, so what we had. Uh, uh, we had this conditions of learning. What are the conditions under which learning happens effectively? And uh, what are the factors one has to consider in order to ensure that the training is happening uh, the expected uh, um, pace and um, delivering at the desired results? Um, it was also Malcolm Knowles who came up with this andragogy, where uh, he came up with the idea that the way children learn and the way adults learn are totally different phenomena. And we need to uh, design our training for adults in a different way than we design our training for the children. So uh, the uh, 
the differences were brought out very broadly by Alton Knowles, and further a lot of research has happened. And we also had uh, Albert Bandura who contributed with this social learning theory where we all learn from observing the society around, from um, the belief system that under which we were brought up mm-hmm. as the childhood messages that we were taught. Everything affects our learning experience is what Albert Bandura was um, pronouncing very hard. And uh, later we had Howard Gardner who came up with this multiple intelligence theory that each and every individual is so unique and uh, he has multiple intelligence. It's not that one person is one good at one thing. He can be good at many other things at different degrees. So a learning uh, experience should cater all type of intelligence what he tried to bring in. So it, it, this is how uh, the, uh, these are the various learning theories that has given a lot of dimensions into how learning happens. Uh, moving forward, uh, we can classify all the learning theories into three broad classes. One is behaviorism, second is social learning theory, and the third one is cognitivism. Um, the prime, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the key Theories in behaviorism is classical conditioning and operation conditioning. Social learning theory, the, one of the greatest things was given by Albert Bandura. And then third, uh, we have cognitivism where IP model and constructivism as uh, two different you know, theories that we have. So today our focus will be on this information processing model. Uh, how information processing plays the center role in cognitivism. How it is going to be the uh, game changer in any training or learning experience is going to be our primary focus. Uh, this we have quickly um, seen some time back. We have three different domains of learning. One is affective, one is like cognitive and psychomotor. And uh, IP model primarily talks about cognitive domain. So we will be starting off with the cognitive domain because that's the primary reason why um, instruction design came into existence. People were, um, in 1950s, as I said, they wanted to give instruction to people to execute the job. It was just about the intellectual capability to execute an order. So cognitivism was the primary focus for any instruction at that time. Uh, now, equally, all these three domains are important, affective, cognitive, and psychometric, all plays significant role in, uh, in having a meaningful and constructive learning experience. Any questions? Oh, great. But you don't have to respond no by scribbling on my screen. Um, You can do it on the chat. That will be better. Mm, all right, uh, let's move forward. Uh, we also saw what makes an effective learning. There are three three aspects to it. The first one is defining a very well described, um, defined learning objectives. It has to capture precisely what is the learning expectation, what is the training problem, and addressing that training problem uh, in a systematic way results in formidable and uh, clear and short um, learning objectives, which is easy to understand. And not only, uh, that is one aspect. First you have learning objectives clearly defined. Then what is your next step? How do you design? How do you develop those learning objectives into a real time final output, which will be uh, the, facilitator for uh, your, which will facilitate the learning experience. So you should have a strong methodology, you should have a strong strategy. And having a, so that is another wing of uh, effective learning. One is that you have a strong objective and then you have a strong methodology. But having this two alone is not sufficient. From time to time, you will have to assess and measure whether it is meeting the desired purpose or not. So that that completes the cycle of learning. If the assessment fails, then you'll have to do the iteration again and again 
we'll have to ensure that it goes on revi uh, it goes on multiple revision so that the learning matures and it becomes an effective learning over period of time then we also saw what is hadi model uh, and different uh, phases of hadi model we have discussed we spent about one whole session on hadi model uh, what is anal analysis st uh, stage and what is design stage development implement and evaluation uh, each stage has its own significance and we discussed how we do it in real time uh, uh, in our last session um, for some of you who have missed it i can share the document after this webinar gets completed um, for now uh, i can just give you an insight analysis mode uh, phase consists of you analyzing the training problem and what is the expectations of management what is the learner's expectation what are the challenges and uh, what are the mindset to you understanding the mindset of the audience everything comes into the analysis phase then design uh, so from that analysis phase what you also do is you arrive at what is the expectations uh, from the management what are the expectations from the people and then you collaborate develop uh, strong expectations the final output of analysis phase is learning objectives so for your training program what is the learning objective comes out of this analysis phase once you have this learning you know objectives the next phase is to design how uh, what are the tools and techniques that you are going to do? you are just going to map everything theoretically it is the blueprint the outcome of this design stage is going to be the blueprint uh, for your training program it will have what activities you are going to do how you are going to address a particular challenge what are the techniques that you are going to adopt how you are going to measure it everything comes under design stage then you have this development stage where you start building and making everything that was in the blueprint to come into existence as a as an activity or as a ppt as a workbook anything anything that uh, you have come up as a abstract form in the design phase get materialized in the development stage uh, so once you have developed it cannot be perfect at first place so you just implement and see measure it how it is going to uh, cater the needs and do you take the help of the uh, you know design team to also meet the uh, subject matter experts um, stakeholders and kind of conduct the pilot and assess how it is resulting then you have this evaluation if it is not meeting up the purpose then you do it you repeat it so that's how the process matures uh i think uh, are you guys clear are you guys clear just uh, let me see if i can you know remove some control disable participant anno annotation yeah now they cannot write anything uh, uh, on the screen but you guys can respond in the chat chat section so uh, are you guys clear so far you have any questions great uh now let's get into the main theme uh information processing model this why information processing model this is the art and soul of cognitive domain uh information processing model as given an alternate dimension into training it said uh that we are not just you know some uh, re we are not uh, responding to some sort of stimuli and our behaviors are not just uh, you know a mere a reaction to some external triggers rather there is a brain which accumulates all the experiences and then processes it and then responds to it it is the it is the first model which said that we are responsible for our behaviors it brought in lot of um connect 
it also uh, it also kind of connected loosely you know uh, hanging st strings together and then form a first very sens sensible model uh, which talks about how our behaviors are formed and what contributes um, how our brain plays a significant role in our actions and, and our thinking process everything so that, that is this primary uh, model it is the first model which was developed in 1950s um, between 1950s to 1960s uh, with the invention of computers um, it is also called as uh, computer mind analogy for the simple reason uh, this model weaves human brain as a computer you know just if you want to understand a computer you will have to go and touch upon the cpu similar way if you want to understand our human behavior you need to touch upon the way how our human brain functions so that's why it is called computer mind analogy it says that uh, it, uh, our brain receives processes it and then responds so the brain is the you know brain is the thing that uh, processes information uh, we are the processing system we are information processing. human being itself is the information processing system that's how it weaves human being as uh, yes of course there are some contradictions to it there are some sort of you know disputes to it but this system cannot be ignored ip model always plays a very significant role in terms of um, as its own place it has it has its own place in uh, learning uh, 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 establishing an effective learning um, process so <clears throat> let's let's take a dig at what ip model is in a in a shorter while uh, and we will also be seeing what are the different types of memory what is schema and how we can put this ip model into practical use all right okay so i am getting a message that this session will end in another 10 minutes so i think uh, we will just stick with this i hope we can finish this off provided uh, we all you know contribute uh, and act faster <clears throat> so the basic assumptions of ib model is that it assumes everything that we uh, do we process um, it's a series of processing system we have attention we have perception and we have short term memory and several other things these all uh, integrate together and then we learn um, uh, or we process the information from the environment in a particular fashion is what it is one one assumption second is that uh, uh, any new information that we receive can be accommodated or altered or um, it can change or replace uh, the already existing information in order to accommodate the new information third thing is that uh, um so there is a cognitive performance you have to establish a cognitive performance and define what is the expected uh, result and your processes and structure are going to cater that cognitive performance requirement then uh, ip model is similar to that of our computer these are some of the assumptions there are many assumptions and these are some of the uh, primary uh, four objectives you can have, so assumptions that you can say so this is the ip model it says that there are three, three types of uh, memory one is that uh, we have sensory memory and then we have working memory and long term memory the purpose of sensory memory is to receive uh, the signals from the outside world uh, the smell that we uh, get or the is that we feel uh, the touch everything is uh, all our five senses basically um, has its own set of memory span it ranges from 3 to 7 seconds like for instance whatever i spoke about one minute back or 30 seconds back uh, the exact words you cannot say because the capacity of your uh, ears is to store only up to 7 seconds not beyond that so whatever i spoke Seven seconds before, you would have already forgotten. Now, uh, so that is that's how our sensory memory works. It is just for a few seconds, from three seconds to seven seconds. 
then we have something called working memory where working memory is uh, you practice you just uh, repeat it and then you just um, replay it in your mind again and again the whatever you have captured uh, stays for little bit longer time for instance an understanding of whatever i have, have been talking till now uh, the meaning that you made could last for about 5 to 15 seconds whatever i was talking for last 15 seconds you would have processed and then you would have gained something in your head um, but that also keeps moving away the working memory is also limited uh, so whatever information i give you receive it from your sensory memory you just process it you just store what is important you just make some meaning out of it and if you feel that it is very important then you repeatedly uh no work on it yes this is you if you start valuing it it moves into the long term memory uh so this is long term memory capacity is infinite and it stays there almost permanently so this is what the model says and uh, why this model is very important let's try to understand uh when we talk about learning as an experience we want our participants to uh Uh, you know take it as a, as a value level go practice and then show changes in their behavior or in performance but if this is how the brain works you know you are uh, giving a very effective training program uh, yeah just you have some questions one second yes i mean What's your question? Oh, all right, all right. Okay, it was a mistake. I think some uh, Hello Hello Once again I think we have some uh just let me just stop receiving signals from other people because it is interfering with my yeah i think now it's fine all right <clears throat> so we have been talking about this ip model and uh, why this ip model is important we were uh, discussing and uh, okay now we understand that or we have sensory uh, memory we uh, as a trainer we uh, are to be very uh, understanding of how learning happens at first place with respect to the cognitive elements are concerned our sensory memories received as a participant each and every body receives your uh, input uh, through their sensory memory 
and each and everybody processes it differently even though the source of information is one even though you are the person who is delivering the instruction each and every person perceives in a different way why is that so any any guess why it is so why each and every person understands the same information in different ways why all right so owing to the time constraints i'll be just moving on um, the main reason why uh, each and every individual perceives in a different way is because uh, so there is something called schema our schemas are different schema is uh, how information is organized or processed in the brain it is a mental array in which all the information that you have received is stored in a particular format this schema um works in a uh, consists of many components i will be showing you quickly what that is uh, there is something called schema theory which says the world is so complex that people are able to make some sense out of it right then each person receives the information in less than perfect ways the, the completeness is Uh, it may not the information may not be complete it may not be accurate it may, may not be reliable it may be distorted it can be uh, manipulated so many things are there so what the information that the person receives is always less than perfect and um what is the existing conditioning that is there in the brain that also affects how a person interprets a message let's say uh uh a person coming from a day all right so we were discussing about schema at last uh, last session when it got completed we were discussing about schema uh, i was saying that we have a mental array uh, in our brain uh, in which we store information that we receive and each and every person's mental array is different it is so unique and each and every person processes the same information in different ways and the reason being we all have different childhood experience different upbringing our social experiences are different our life experiences are different the value system that was taught to us is different and the outlook of life itself is different uh, the basic belief system some some of you could be believing in something some of you don't believe in something and some of you feel something you uh, some of you could have some strong views or opinion about something and some of you don't have any view at all or probably have negative view about something so it it's all uh, if you see uh, you are basically the value system and the opinion is also different from people to people and the main reason being how we are exposed to a particular environment how what were our childhood experiences what were the messages thought to us affects us collectively in our processing of any information that comes to us so this collective accumulation of all the opinions views prejudices preconditions preconceived notions uh, are stored in a particular fashion in the mind that pre uh, no uh, that totality of all the experiences put together and how it is stored is called schema so each and every person schema is different and the way each and every person interprets a message is also different obviously now if you want to make a, if you want your participants to learn if they have to learn something uh, then it is very important because whatever you are teaching may or may not be in sync with their schema supposedly uh, let's say that you are going to give a lecture on you know capitalism and uh, your participants are communist in mindset what do you think will be the reception of your message how do you think they they will will they be more accommodating in accepting your message or will they be confronting or will they be neutral so that's the challenge you need to understand so the 
place, the environment, everything about them determines whether a particular message will be received or will be ignored. So audience schema is very, very important for us to understand. Uh, schema is a very broad topic and it is a science in itself and uh, I will not be doing a justice if I have to say this is all about schema. It's a, you, it's a big science by itself. You need to get into that and there is a very big uh, article written in 1983 uh, by one of the famous, uh, famous person, politi uh, an American politician, political uh, expert. He has written on schema for the first time in 1983. I'll be sharing that article with you after this session, which will give a broad insight into uh, how the schema theory has evolved and what is its role in information processing system. Um, so moving forward, these are the components that I was telling. Uh, so perception, how as an individual, you receive a given information is perception. Assumption is something you derive out of logic or you feel that probably this is why things are happening this way, your own assumption. It's not something biased, it's a natural uh, tendency for brain to assume things, so assumptions. Preconceived notion is that a strong opinion formed because of the environment or your experience and it is a biased belief. And belief is what you have been taught all through your life by probably uh, by your parents, by your teachers, or by the social uh, upbringing, everything uh, adds us, adds how in what we believe. Um, and our childhood experiences, what as a child you experience, uh, because whatever we are today, it's um, all the first seven years of our life that shapes our understanding about life uh, predominantly. So if you, uh, if you are thinking in a particular way, if you are acting in a particular way, if you are behaving in a particular way, uh, it all means that the large part of your childhood is you know, interfering and making you to behave in a particular way. Uh, uh, and also the social setting, the environment in which you are uh, also makes big impact on how we process the information. Plus the kind of conditioning that we have underwent. So all these things affects uh, our schema. Any questions? If you have any questions, please drop a message on the chat window. All right, uh, I think we can move forward. So this is uh, the slide which we were discussing and opening. Now let's put things back into perspective. Let's see how we can put this IP model into action. How we can you know, reap some benefit uh, out of this model. I said for uh, Effective learning experience, there are three wings that contribute. One is learning objective, then methodology and strategy that we are employing in order to convert those learning objectives into a uh, physical content or a, you know, training program. And then how we assess uh, the effectiveness of it is also one of the factors which sums uh, up to effective learning. So these three wings play a very significant role, which you have already seen. And now, it, it is your creativity as a content developer or as a trainer to put our learn, whatever we have learned from this IP model into uh, action. Let's say if it is about learning objectives, what do you think we should be doing? How can we write learning objectives? Simple things we need to consider. Uh, one is that when we are, our, our learning objective is the last, uh, is the final output of analysis phase from ADI model. But during that analysis phase, can we employ this IP model is the question. 
can be employed ip model in analysis space of adi model all right yes of course we can employ uh, our uh, one of the main uh, job in analysis space in adi model is to study the audience uh, studying the audience profile so while studying their audience profile you might be thinking what uh, what is their age and what is the working um, you know challenges in the work environment what is the manager feedback everything you will be considering but have we considered what are what are the schemas of our audience what is the general perception about this particular topic on which you are going to train are you capturing the schema of your audience is a question that we need to think about uh say for instance um you are going to train on you know uh, let's say Uh, taking initiatives you are going to train uh, let's say there is a assembly line in a manufacturing company and you are, you are going to train those uh, supervisors on taking initiatives you cannot simply talk with their managers or talk with their peers and then capture something and then come up some sort of learning objective and design a program and deliver it uh of course all these steps are important for you to uh, you know come up with this learning objectives but what is even more important is to understand the theme of the audience um it is important some of them may be feeling that the management is not giving the freedom to explore if that is the perception it may not be the reality but if that is the perception of the audience i am so creative i wanted to execute but my management is not so creative or giving me the freedom to explore in that case that schema needs to be addressed as the first step it is not about the problem itself but even the root even before that the psychology of the problem is also important you need to understand why people are not willing to take initiative so if the psychological aspect can be addressed only if you know what is the schema of your audience so first step is to understand the scheme of your audience that's why ip model plays a very significant role in building a very effective learning experience okay let's move to the, the that's one aspect there are multiple ways that you can uh, implement ip model into this uh, in, into any way into any form of content development training anywhere that you can employ i am just giving you an example how it can be employed in designing a learning objectives um it can also be used very well in methodology and strategy let's say there are about 20 problems the management is facing from a particular team can you create 20 learning objectives and then deliver a 5 day workshop or program and expect it to be very effective of course there are companies that do but is it going to fetch the result is it over doing or is it okay or it is under doing what is your view of course if we just go back a few slides before let me just take it here are if you look at the working memory and the sensory memory at any point of time it can take up to 3 to 7 units of information or if it is in the working memory it can take up to 9 information so 9 information is the maximum that it can take at any point of time in a single day if you are taking four different themes and you are delivering a training program on four different themes it is perfect perfectly all right because 
there are not too many teams that are covered and our brain can build upon the pre uh, no existing knowledge and further additionally you are building it over that which becomes much easier whereas so coming up with totally new things new concepts in a single day and if your objectives are more than four let's say that you are coming up with eight or nine objectives by the end of the day the program might have been excellent you would have delivered the best way and your audience would have also enjoyed each and every session of the segment of it but at the end of the day if you ask what are the things that you will go back and apply people will have no idea because the first thing which you have already which you have thought might have been already gone away from their mind because learning is uh, possible only in the long term memory if you want something to be retained or to be practiced to be uh, you know taken it as a value level and uh, kept it for long uh, throughout the life then you will have to ensure that your audience is taking it from their working memory to the long term memory so you will have to repeat it empty number of times ask them to uh, you know perform uh, some activities engage them in so many ways on a particular team itself so that the learning happens from working memory to the long term memory whenever the information that any new information that comes to the brain through sensory memory moves into the working memory and with the repetition and practice if it moves to the long term memory that becomes the life long learning experience and that word the word for that is called learning transfer only when a learning transfer has happened you can ensure that you can say that learning has happened the movement of new information from the working memory to the long term memory is very important in order to create a meaningful and learning, meaningful learning experience okay let's get back so again this assessment in assessments also you can have uh, you can use ip model um <coughs> let's say um that you uh, you are delivering a session for about half a day and for 3 uh, 4 hours you have talked at the end of the session you are giving a form asking him choose the best answer then you are giving some 10 questions is that right way to assess that is that could be one of the way that you can assess but it cannot be the only way from time to time assessment can be of multiple uh, no methods you can also uh, engage them in a debate and see their understanding you can ask them to take side and see how they are you know how they have understood the subject that is one way to ensure that they have learned second thing is that you can also ask them to uh, say share how they are going to implement this lesson in their work environment or in their life to see their application side of uh, their learning so there are multiple ways that you can engage and the assessment is not the last step it is a continuous step and it has to be there at each and every stage uh, so it plays a very significant role um it, this ip model uh, can be used at various stages depending upon your creativity it can it is a very unique and open uh, model which can be employed not only by uh, instruction designers it can be employed by any person uh, who is in managerial role performance coach can also employ um even uh, content uh, writer uh, you know bloggers bloggers can also write uh utilize this information processing how i can tell you um see the information processing also talks about strategies there are three different strategies that you can use in order to promote your message some of the posts that you go to facebook you see some of the posts are going viral and anything that you write may get some about 10 or 12 likes or probably 15 or 20 likes where somebody writes and then it becomes immediately some sort of sensation thousands and thousands of people following what is that they do there is a big research behind blogging and if you see what is what is the research behind blogging you will see that ip model stands there it says that you create you the title has to be very captivating 
it has to have an element of pull it it can be positive or it can be negative but it has to be catchy so there are certain strategies and invariably anywhere in the social uh, media era you will find ip model and all the learning theories being blended and exploited for monetization purpose it is there in each and every post that you are seeing that is going viral so uh, ip model is just a general platform it's a common model it can be exploited by a, a, utilized i is the best better word but people uh, marketing people most likely love this word exploiting that resource so uh, if you are a person who wants to monetize this is one of the best way to exploit uh, the model in your favor so likewise we have several uh, you know uh, means and methods where you can reap the benefits of ip model um see uh, in the second session i think we have seen this cone of learning um if we just read something if we ask our you know learners to read they just retain only 10 percentage of what they have read two weeks after the session if they are hearing it from you then they can retain about 20 percentage if they see something that you are showing them some video or showing them some sort of uh, you know uh, role play or uh, say showing them some sort of you know uh, model uh, then they can retain about 30 percentage if they are asking if you are asking them to you know watch a movie or looking at an exhibit and all these things about 50 percentage they can uh, retain if they are asked to participate in a discussion debate um, then they can retain about 70 percentage but if we combine all this reading right reading doing and then experience all put together then about 90 percentage can be retained why is this so important so uh, one is that this cone of learning helps us understand what are all the elements that needs to be captured in a session how uh, if you are conduct if you are planning to conduct a session then it should have all these elements as one of the key takeaway second thing is you cannot give too many number of things also um uh, say you conduct one um one activity for one one team uh, and you might be under the impression that it is enough but it is not for a particular team depending upon the complexity probably two or three activities required for the same single team itself uh that that input you can gain from ip model because repetition is what that takes any new learning from working memory to the long term memory if you want your information to be you know retained for the over the longer time then repetition is important it is not only about creating an activity but how often you are repeating the lesson throughout one in, one example i can give you today we are doing this third session when i did the first session i did a recap when i started the second session i started with the first session uh, recap and then brought in today also i started off with the session uh, first session and second session we discussed and then we entered into the third session why because if we are building on the existing knowledge the learning becomes easier that's how you need to build yeah, the more and more uh, information that was already discussed is being given again and again your retention enhances multiple times so these are uh, the some of the ways and let's come to the last stage putting things into perspective so during tna you can capture audience schema then writing learning objectives qualitatively and quantitatively how many number of uh, objectives are required uh, and how what is what is the quality uh, behind those learning objective also matters and then you need to understand any new learning happens by adding on to the existing knowledge or altering the existing knowledge or replacing the existing knowledge learning can happen only by three, three of these things so this is one take away and then only when the transfer has happened from the working memory to the long term memory we can say that the learning has happened in its truest sense uh i hope uh, i have covered this 
model in a, a brief way. And if you have any questions, um, we can just have some time for discussion and uh, close. So any questions? Any questions? Okay. Let's wait for about a minute and then if there are no questions, then we can close the session. Uh, also, I just wanted to understand how was this session and your uh, you know, feedback. Uh, it will be, you know, good insight for me to uh, relook into how to better this program next time. And uh, any suggestions or feedbacks, uh, I deeply welcome your views. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed the session. And uh, really, uh, it was nice time to be with you all. Thanks a lot for taking out some time in uh, joining our learning experience. So hope to catch you all up with uh, some other topic next time. And, uh, have a very great evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thanks a lot. Goodbye.